Okay, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm very happy to welcome all of you to the opening of this conference, a New Visual Narratives at the Wuji Film School. This is a conference that uh, wraps up uh, four years of the Visual Narratives uh, Laboratory at the school, which was made uh, possible uh, thanks to a grant uh, from the Ministry of uh, Science, Learning and Education. The coming uh, two or three days, in these uh, three days, we will be celebrating it will be a celebration. We were uh, going, we had intended to meet every year, but as we know, uh, the COVID pandemic uh, uh, hit us uh, two years ago, and uh, many of the artists uh, working with us uh, never had a chance to meet in person. And uh, today I uh, heard, I overheard people saying, oh, there you are in the flesh. And, uh, I, we're very, very gratified. We're very happy. I need to say that for the time being, uh, Milena Fiedler, the uh, rector of the film school, is not with us today. She had car trouble. She is en route, uh, but hasn't um, arrived yet. Uh, she will be joining us later today. That's Milena Fiedler, the rector of the film school. And now let me consult my notes. A few words about the conference. These uh, panels, the panels are arranged along the lines of the laboratory. Every panel was uh, conceived and devised by the heads of the workshops. So now I wanted to introduce uh, them briefly. Uh, today we'll have uh, panels um, related to the um, workshop of um, interactive uh, narratives and S3D. So after the opening uh, lecture, there will be a, a presentation by myself and Katarzyna Boratyn uh, from the interactive uh, narratives. The S3D panel was uh, prepared by Piotr Matysiak. Uh, he will be presenting his uh, project uh, tomorrow. Tomorrow, there will be a uh, panel about film essays, and that panel was uh, the work of Stanisław Ligusiński, Kuba Mikurda, and Michał Matuszewski. After that, we'll have uh, two panels organized by the VR panel, uh, VR, um, sorry, VR workshop, Jacek Nagłowski and Pola Borkiewicz were the heads of unit. And on Sunday, we'll have a panel devoted to our experimental workshop, which was headed by Magdalena Sobocińska, who I wanted to welcome uh, these uh, workshop uh, leaders, uh, the persons behind the Visual Narratives Lab. I wanted to welcome the whole community of artists, uh, scholars, uh, researchers who will be sharing their findings and discussing their projects. And uh, now I want to hand it over to Anna Schiller, who co-organized this uh, conference uh, with me. Uh, uh, first, uh, Mr. Krzysztof, uh, the Dean of Studies. I'm representing Milenia Fiedler, but uh, together with Krzysztof, we have been running a lab for nearly four years now. Uh, four years mm, ago, when we were thinking of doing something new in this uh, film school, we wanted to let in a breath of fresh air, a new approach, a new uh, perspective on media, a way of uh, coming up with new narratives, new visual narratives. And we regret uh, that we weren't able to do a recap every year. The first conference, the one we had uh, the first year 
of the project was very interesting, a lot of interesting um, conclusions, but then the pandemic hit. Uh, fortunately, in this uh, last year of the grant, because we do hope that the project uh, will be continued, we will be applying for further funding. And I'm happy that we're all together here today. We're um, welcome to the film school. Thank you very much, uh, Dean. Uh, first of all, we want these three days to be a site for critical reflection about technology, not only technology, but also the subject matter addressed by artists in their uh, work. Uh, there is an exhibition that we've uh, mounted uh, together with Krzysztof and Agnieszka. Uh, it's uh, in two venues, uh, this uh, building and the new media building just next door and uh, we do encourage you to take a look and um, tell us what you think we welcome your feedback and if you're interested in um, attending uh, guided tours which will be guided by the curators we have one at 6 p.m. and today and another one at 11 a.m. tomorrow Agnieszka Sural a few housekeeping notes. I need to check my crib sheet. My, um, we have a very extensive program. And the uh, second issue is uh, an ex uh, exhibition, Mechanical Souls, but you have to sign up. Uh, Mechanical Souls is something where you have to sign up, and there are still, there's still uh, vacancies. It's um, directed by Kel Moore together with uh, Teatr Studio, Gael Moore together with uh, Teatr Studio in Warsaw. If you want artists, you want to listen to artists uh, discussing their work, then there will be case studies, uh, brief uh, films, um, brief little short video clips. Uh, uh, that were uh, prepared, that were made by Titus uh, Szabelski. You can watch them by the information desk on large screens. Uh, statements by artists about um, the works on display, as well as works that are not yet on uh, display, but they will be shown later this year. These presentations are available on our website. If you take a look at the demo tab. All these uh, pieces are um, there. You can watch them in the comfort of your own hotel room. And apart from uh, case studies and these uh, films, there's a teaser trailer for Inside, which is a project, a film that's being made by S3D. Uh, you can view it in 3D goggles. And um, so do pick them up somewhere. A uh, few words about what's uh, coming up in the uh, film theater. Uh, today at 6 p.m., the essay workshop uh, has a review of uh, film essays, uh, which will conclude at about uh, 8 p.m. And tomorrow at 5.30, there will be a premiere of a film, Non-Human Creativity, by Joanna Zelinska. There will be a, a discussion after Afterwards, and now um, we have networking. The after party will be held uh, tomorrow at 8 p.m. There will be a DJ set, and uh, VJ Michał Szota will provide the visuals. And I believe uh, that's uh, the most important information for now. Apart from housekeeping, I would like to uh, remind you to uh, wash your hands, to sanitize your hands, and uh, generally maintain as much social distance as you uh, feel is appropriate. Um, Krzysztof, uh, this is such an extensive project. I feel we should uh, mention all the persons involved. So this was indeed um, a team uh, project. And now, uh, in closing, I wanted to thank everyone who was involved in this um, 
project, um, everybody who contributed to this. Uh, there will be a, f I'm, I'll read all the names. This will take two or three minutes, but I think it's worth um, recognizing uh, all of them. So here goes. And uh, it wouldn't have been possible without all these people. I wanted to thank and special thanks go to Jan Ledworowski. Thank you, Wojciech Kubiak. Upstairs, Jacek Laube, Szymon Kucharski, Tytok Szwytus Szabelski, Lidia Krawczyk, Stanisław Masina, Łukasz Depczyk, Wojciech Bryndel, Julia Kacalak, Tomasz Stępniak, Mateusz Stępień, Artur Wiecha, Krzysztof Wasiak, Grzegorzowi Zawickiemu, Zawicki, Bartosz Staszewski, Krzysztofowi Strumille, Krzysztof Danielowi Strumille, Kamili Kapłaniak, Michałowi Martiniemu, Wojciechowi Justynie, Tomaszowi Andrzejewskiemu, Marcinowi Zalewskiemu, Kamilowi Bieńkowi, Maćkowi Bień, e, Bernasiowi, Marcinowi Korbusowi, Kacprowi Nowakowi, Nikodemowi Wojciechowskiemu, Aleksandrze Mrówczyńskiej, Agencji Mediocre, która nas wspiera PR-owo. And the uh, Mediocre Agency for their PR support. Monice Żelazowskiej, Małgorzacie Czarneckiej, Kasze Szaniawskiej i Daniel, Danielowi Malonowi, którzy dla nas And robili proofreading. Daniel Malone I całym naszym zespołowi współpracowników i współpracowniczek oraz tłumaczom którzy są tutaj z nami i choć są niewidoczni, są bardzo istotni dla tej imprezy. Na koniec chciałbym jeszcze podziękować Post Studio Noviti. In closing, I wanted to thank Post Studio Noviti for the video visual identification. They've been working with us from the start. They designed the website and we work together on an ongoing, regular basis. Marcin and Kasia, thank you very much. It's great working with you. Ale oczywiście, że tak. To jest na razie zewnętrzna sytuacja. A ja chciałbym jeszcze od siebie And personally, I would Sura, like to thank Agnieszka for mounting, preparing the exhibition and Anna Schiller. I'm so glad we all made it. It wasn't a foregone conclusion. And now, um, we'll, uh, today will be will take until 5 p.m. Tomorrow, 5:30, and. On uh, Sunday, it'll be uh, just, uh, we won't have uh, 30 minute presentations. Instead, we were looking, we want an interactive uh, dialogue. Let me just uh, briefly say, we see all of you here in Łódź at the film school. But now I want to address everybody who's joining us online. I know that there's a lot of people uh, watching. Uh, tomorrow, they say the weather will get better. It's really nice here. Let's uh, come together after COVID. Uh, I know that we're all used to to uh, interacting online, but it's always worth coming in person. So uh, consider doing that, please. Okay, and now I will switch into English. Um, because we will be speaking English, uh, as a lot of our guests and speakers are English speakers, the last uh, panel will be in Polish. <laughs> Uh, I would like to introduce our first speaker, um, Professor Felix Stadler. Hello, Felix Stadler, um, who is professor for digital culture and network theory at the Zurich University of the Arts. His work focuses on the intersection of cultural, political, and technological dynamics, in particular on new modes of common space production, control society, copyright, and transformation of subjectivity. He not only works as an academic, but also as cultural producer, being a, a moderator of the mailing list NetTime since 1998, and a member of the World Information Institute and the Technopolitics Working Group, both based in Vienna. Um, please welcome Felix. The floor is yours. Okay. Um, um, thank you, uh, Christoph, for the invitation and for the introduction. Um, and thanks for the entire team 
for the excellent organization. It's a real pleasure to be here in person after, I think it's my first conference in about two years that I'm actually present. Uh, so that's a great pleasure to be here. I want to go through a lot of material quite quickly, so we have some time for a discussion in which we then can deepen some of the aspects that I can merely touch upon. Usually when we think about immersion uh, in the context of the arts, we think about a technical condition, something that requires complex technology for production and reception. Here, for example, you see the 360 degrees set up at the immersive art space that we have at the Art University in Zurich. So immersion is created as a very unnatural condition, something that requires us to be surrounded by technology, which immediately leads us to think about this technology, its capacities, its problems, its uh, workings, and so on. But I would like today to think about immersion not as a technology, but as an epistemology, and draw out some of the challenges and potential of this particular way of, standing, of understanding the world and our place in it. So moving away from technology allows us to think of immersion as an existential, not to say existentialist condition. We are always thrown into the world. The world is always around us. We cannot but be immersed in it in all kinds of ways. Hell is other people, Jean-Paul Sartre famously said, and the hellish part was that there is no escape. We are always necessarily in the world, even if we should, even should we one day really start to live in outer space. We'll take the world with us. So this indicates that non-immersion, the idea that the world is in front of us, is not, also not a natural um, condition, but rather one that is produced and has been produced by technology. And in particular, it has been produced by media technology and in particular, the printing press. This technology gave us, that is the Western literate cultures, as McLuhan famously put it more than half a century ago, an eye for an ear. Meaning this technology translated all experiences into a visual experience and not just any visual experience, but a particular one text on a page that is an experience that is standardized, linear, fixed, and in front of the reader. And this, in turn, gave us a way of seeing the world and being in the world that corresponded to this experience. The perspective became the dominant visual paradigm from the early 15th century on and this was reinforced by photography in the 19th and 20th century. Space was presented as three-dimensional. It had fixed relations between foreground, middle, and back. And this was understood to be a natural way of seeing, even though, as you can see, it's a highly technical way of seeing and there's nothing natural about the single fixed eye. There is a close relationship between aesthetics and epistemology. So this was not just a way of seeing, but also a way of thinking. And this way of thinking has become to characterize modernity and many of its most successful endeavors, most of all science. This epistemology and the scientific practices that incorporated it was based on a number of practices and assumptions of how to understand the world in front of us. One was the notion of a critical distance as a relation to the world. In order to understand something, one had to move away from it. One had to distance, one had to disentangle oneself from it. 
this is the necessary condition, this critical distance, to produce the most desired quality of knowledge of all, objectivity. That means understanding the world without being part of it. Understanding the world in a way in which the observer plays no role. Assuming that everyone sees the same, no matter who they are or where they are located. What we see here is uh, Louis XIV visiting the French Academy of Sciences. We see people standing around models of the world. And there is a perfect correspondence between the model, which is inside, and the world, which you can see in the background, which is, is outside. And if you, if you look closely in the back, it is under construction. So it is being remade according to the plans and the models that the king is looking at. You can see, obviously, this Baroque garden, which is a perfect representation of a, of a plan that was first drawn up on a map and then imposed on nature. And this implies that there is an outside, that the observer is outside the system, that the individual is outside society, and that nature is outside of culture, or the other way around, culture is outside of nature. But this is not just a way of thinking about space and epistemology, it's also a way of thinking about relations of things in space, about processes in space. And the most important relation that this type of thinking creates is the notion of cause and effect. First the cause, and then the effect, in a linear sequence. If aesthetics shapes epistemology and epistemology shapes politics, that is a way of organizing the world. Relationships between theme and thinking and between thinking and acting in the world. This is nowhere more clear than in the modernist vision of the city, of the spatial organization. Here seen in uh, the famous uh, Le Corbusier plan voisin for the reconstruction of Paris from 1925. But these relationships extend all the way to creating a particular type of, of subjectivity that is the individual as a mode of being. This is the notion that one's own mind is a defining unit. I think, therefore I am, and I am separate from all others. This is the notion that separation is first and connection comes second. And on a social level, this connection is always then problematic and can be achieved either through a, co um, through a social contract or it can be imposed by a le Leviathan state from above. But this worldview has been collapsing under the weight of its own contradictions for a long time now. Many cultural historians point to the demolition of the prud Igo housing complex in St. Louis, this quintessential modern housing complex in 1972, which you know, was live broadcast on TV as the end of modern modernity and the beginning of postmodernity. But we are way past this point as well. The collapse of the notion of non-immersion, the, the idea that the world is something that is in front of us, uh, has many dimensions. Probably the most dramatic manifestation itself is the ecological destruction that the industrial modern civilization has created based on the notion of being separate from nature, based on the notion of infinite resources, and the notion that pollution is an externality, that is something that is outside of the system, that is outside of the economic system and therefore can be disregarded. This is no longer possible. We all felt that as we walked, you know, here through the sun. In a closed world, there can be no externalities and pollution doesn't, doesn't disappear. The consequences of things staying with us become ever more important. The notion of inside and outside are clearly not working. This was made even more urgent and more you know, it had more everyday life uh, impact through the cor corona 
pandemic. In such a pandemic, it makes no sense to ask, is this a cultural or a natural event? Is this inside or outside of us? Is this global or local? And it doesn't even matter if the virus technically is not even a living thing. Parallel to the collapse of the modern epistemology, there's always <clears throat> there's also the creation of new ways of seeing and new ways of relating to the world. This is, of course, a long and very uneven process, but nevertheless, this is an irreversible development. And in this sense, we are way past uh, postmodernity that simply can uh, assert this break. For want of a better world and in the context of, of this conference, I want to call this way of seeing and of being immersive. In a way, understanding us of being inside the world, of being related to diverse life forms and agency is nothing unusual. In fact, most non-modern, non-Western cosmologies, in particular those that are called indigenous, have always understood the world in this way. One could say then that we are simply reverting back to an older way of thinking, of understanding immersion, you know, again, as an existential condition. But in my view, this would be a misunderstanding, despite the fact that this is also the case. But I would say it's not the most important aspect of the story. Because what is new now is that we live in a fully globalized world, even if it seems at the moment that it's fracturing again into ever more distant blocks. But we are living surrounded by what Timothy Morton calls hyperobject, that is, man-made objects that are too large, too complex, too fast-moving, too slow-moving, too distributed to be directly perceivable, understandable by the human senses. Climate breakdown was the um, point in case that uh, Morton thought about, but COVID obviously was another one. Cloud infrastructures on the internet are another one. And there are nearly infinite number of such hyper objects that you know, define our current condition. It's because of the existence of these hyper objects, what is new in the experience of the immersion, and which makes it different from the old one, and this is also why we need a conference like this to call for new visual strategies to understand this transformed kind of existential condition. A new aesthetic to create a sense of this contemporary condition in which immersion is both an existential and a technical condition. It is important because, as I said before, aesthetics is all affects not just ways of seeing, but also ways of being and ways of acting. This also means that we need strategies to create aesthetics that can express this new type of immersion and the world that we are in the process of creating. I would like to focus now on the types of relation that technical immersion as an aesthetic medium can produce. These different relations are not mutually uh, exclusive. They can pres be present at the same time. But perhaps separating them can be useful when, uh, in terms of analyzing these immers uh, immersive worlds and their possibility. The first relation is, is escapism, meaning that what happens outside the artificial uh, immersion uh, has no relationship to uh, the, the world which has created. Uh, the most extreme example of some, such an escapist uh, relation in the, in the real world is the roller coaster, you know, whether, it be, whether it's virtual or physical. It is a very strong immersion while it lasts. It, it merely blocks out all other uh, perception of the outside world, but when you step out of it, when it's over, it's over. And there are a lot of uh, similar kind of uh, escapist um, your know, environments that we have created, the theme park, the holiday resort, and in some way even the wildlife reserve. And this notion of the immersion as an, as an escape um, <clears throat> is the original notion of the metaverse in Neil Stevenson's Snow Crash. It's a way to, dis to escape a truly dystopian world. 
the second kind of fundamental relation or, or uh, that can be, that can be uh, created in these you know, technologically created um, immersive worlds uh, is the relation of control. This stems on, was based on the maximum difference between those inside the immersive world and those outside of, of this world. Because the fact that everything is constructed by someone can be used to exert control over everything that happens inside this newly created world. This is, in a way, Deleuze control society at the extreme. It is a world of, door, of doors that are, that are open for some and closed for others. It is a world of nudges, and it uh, is a world of an extremely non-level playing field, a world of extreme power differentials between those who set the parameters of control and those who have to live um, under it. And this is the most likely outcome and perhaps the strongest drive, this, this, this desire to control uh, of the new attempt to create the metaverse on a proprietary platform. And this, in my view, is a vision that we have to, to fight with everything we have. The third one is, of course, the most difficult one, and it's about the coexistence. And it's a work of artists, designers, and cultural producers to give expression to these potentialities of coexistence. It's an aesthetic that opens the way to a politics of understanding intellectually as well as effectively the way we are, we are co-constituted and are co-constituting the world on all scales, from the most immediate local to the global through hyper-objects. We have to start with the recognition that there is really no outside. The world is not in front of us. Immersion is a reality, both natural and artificial. The philosopher Peter Sloterdijk spoke of <clears throat> Weltinnenraum, a kind of a global interior that we are all inhabiting. With that, also notions of objectivity, of how to you know, account for the world, need to and are being reworked. Instead of the God's view, where, where, where someone is seeing everything, no matter where, where they look from, instead of this view from nowhere, a view from somewhere is pos postulated. The alternative to objectivity is not subjectivity, as the postmoderns believed, but situatedness. This is knowledge which is on the, at the same time factual, so it's fact-based, but it nevertheless understands how, it, how it's located and how its production depends on very specific conditions that might not be true for, for other situations. And as a consequence, this is knowledge that is very self-consciously partial and understand that it needs to be connected with other knowledges. From this, it's clear that space does not necessarily need to be three-dimensional. and It just need, does not need to confer to a single human observer's point of view. Again, this is nothing fundamentally new. The perspective as a dominant visual framework was in question since the late 19th century, even though photography kind of reinforced it on a practical level. But, but it is only now that this becomes more intuitive and more resonating with everyday experience to think of space as in-dimensional. In digital spaces, the three-dimensional representation it's just one of many possible conventions. And it's not necessarily always the most useful one. We can see this all around us. The world is, is, is multi-century. Here we have a map, a work of a colleague of mine in Zurich, Andres Bossart, who made a map of the sounds of the city of Zurich. The notion of sound being part of the city and not just noise to be avoided is a way of understanding space and what happens when it's no longer dominated by the eye. Of course, we have been trying to understand this for a long time now, but the fact that we still lack a proper language or proper aesthetics for something as simple as the relationship between sounds and space, sound and space indicates the scale of the task 
of developing a new aesthetic. If we take situated ser situatedness seriously, it becomes clear that the way of seeing the world has something to do with our bodies. What we see here is a still from Harun Faroqi's work, Transmission, from 2007, in which he investigates how people use touch to relate to something that is absent. And what we see here is people touching the names of friends and relatives who died as soldiers in the Vietnam War at the Vietnam Memorial. So touch is used to, to relate to something that is no longer here. We need to recognize this notion of embodiedness also in the technical fields. All, also robots have bodies that shape their relation to the world. And in this vein, also AI, which we often th think as immaterial, has a body. It has a history that situates its way of thinking about the world, its way of thinking maybe even about itself. That's you know, a big discussion at the moment. But it is also a very situated practice that we, that we can see how it, the histories and the materialities of its production, of its body, so to speak, uh, shape its way of seeing. And of course, if we move beyond the human and the technical, we see even more directly how cognition is embodied in all kinds of life forms. If we take new theories of sensing seriously, then also non-living entities, you know, natural and artificial, have sensing capacities. And with technology and science, we can translate these sensing capacities into something that our human sensing capacities can understand and read. This again reaches all the way down to the constitution of the subject. It undermines the notion of the individual as something that can be no longer divided. Rather in its place can of, is the individual, something that can be endlessly div divided, something that is in its entity a composite. People, and other animals are now understood as holobions, as complex systems of smaller entities, and not all aspects and not all components of these systems are human. Again, this is something that the pandemic forces us to see every day very clearly. Under such condition, knowledge production cannot be done by closed entities, no matter how specialist they are but takes place as a process of commoning, understood literally as creating a shared understanding of what makes the world. Who belongs to this commons and whose experiences will be included in the sense making is one of the major political questions of the current moment. But this shared understanding of the world with all the hyper objects that define its present is a prerequisite of the ability to act together. And undermining this shared understanding as a political strategy, or is a political strategy of those who do not wish for us to act collectively. And this is why it is so important to develop new narrative strategies, new epistemologies, new aesthetics to understand the complexity of the world. Even though, in the, the context of, of this conference, I would venture that not all of these strategies necessarily need to be visual. And with that, I leave it for that, and I thank you for your presentation and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Felix. Do you want me to take this? Yes. Would you like to sit down? Yeah, sure. Do you have any questions or comments to Felix's talk? Jacek Nagłowski. Hello. Uh, generally, first, I couldn't agree more with most of the stuff you've been saying. But uh, the biggest issue, I suppose, uh, is uh, which was the very beginning and at the very end of your uh, talk and it is about uh, possibilities of the reality we all wish for uh, which is coexistence to happen 
because first there is this danger of control and the uh, possibility of uh, taking control by corporations actually and uh, on the other hand um, there are tendencies and vectors that uh, prohibit this general uh, knowledge to um, uh, yeah to, to rise the the question is what strategies uh, in your opinion can we develop to to fight against that um, <clears throat> i think this is a really um you know, complex process that takes place on a lot of different levels. And um, so I think there's, 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 there's a lot of ways that, uh, you know, this process can be pushed into the right direction and there's no single one kind of Arch Archimedean point from which to really turn this. But I think at a, um, from the point of view of, um, you're an art school or a film school, um, the question of, of a development of aesthetics, a development of a, of, a, of a language that can express this. Because the language that we, and with we, I mean this you know, literate uh, Western culture, that you know, the industrial culture has, has come to, to dominate so many parts of the world, um, we really lack this language. We have we, we we have been trained for you know 500 years um, in 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 a different language that that thinks in dichotomies that thinks in separations that thinks in um, you know the world is out there in front of us um, to to take this example and so this is for me a really crucial part so how how can we um, develop an, an, a way that of, of accounting for these, um, this, this, this immersion. And it is, and it's not something, it's something that, that kind of traditional, kind of pre-modern or ultra-modern ways of thinking can teach us a lot, but it's also something that needs to be um, kind of at the scale that this immersion is taking place. We could not understand global warming and you know climate uh, breakdown without complex um, you know data driven models. But uh, we have this problem that we on the one hand know this model and it's all all big and abstract. On the other hand, we can barely translate it down to our own everyday experience. And this, for me, is 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 a is a, is, a, is a lack of a language. And of course, there, there are very powerful, you know, political actors that do not want a certain language to emerge and a certain way of thinking to emerge. But I, I think as, as, as artists or cultural producers, the level of language is the, for us the most natural one. I'm not saying that this is the, you know, the, the only one that matters or that, you know, first you, 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 you change language and then you change the world. But I think it's an important aspect of this, of, of this much larger development. It's, and it's probably the aspect that is the most amendable to our, our work. Uh, thank you. That was very interesting. And I also uh, agree with a number of points you've made. I just wanted to follow up on that question of the artist and ask, is there actually still room for the idea of the artist, the way especially we've understood it in such kind of modern terms, as an individual or a collective of individuals mm. that achieve something? Or does that model call for a radical rethinking of the very role, position and category of the artist? Could we envisage an artist as a holobiont, for example? And then following up from that, because I don't want to just kind of theorize now and say, mm. this is what the artist should do, and they will either fail or not in that model. But I just wonder, from your experience of working in an art school, uh, have you observed already any of the shifts actually occurring, especially among younger generations of art students coming and wanting different models, different ways of inhabiting that artist category? Mm. Um, <clears throat> probably when you um, think of artists with a capital A, um, this is very difficult, simply because the pressure of the art system 
and I'm now mostly speaking from, from visual arts, kind of fine arts uh, perspective, it's just extremely individualized. It's extremely kind of object-based. It's, it's kind of very traditional. And, and, you know, if you think about um, uh, current ideas and, and experiments and processes that are done, uh, you know, with, with crypto, then it's even worse in terms of, you know, creating individualized ownership and everything becomes a commodity and everything can be traded in these, in these you know, absurd, absurd markets. That's kind of one one side. No, I'm not particularly optimistic that kind of the artist as as the figure um, is 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 kind of an avant-garde in that in that way. Um, on the other hand, I see also in 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 in, in my school uh, a lot of uh, kind of people studying art who are not that interested in the in art as a system as a capital a but more as a pra as as a as a practice of living as a way of of thinking perhaps more holistically of a way of you know really thinking about what it means to be together what it means to um, you know thinking about food thinking about um, uh, you know ecological processes but in a very hands on way it is perhaps a, a, a a kind of an artistic practice that is more geared, even though it has its own problems, to so kind of a, a maker approach, trying to really do things and act in the world rather than just, you know, act symbolically and, and speak symbolically, but with a clear sense that it needs an aesthetic, that it needs a, a language, that it needs to be something that is appealing and, and people can relate to effectively, that is not just a rational project of you know reducing carbon and and stuff like that but it's really about the way of living and that then also peters a bit out into um you know an aesthetic practice or kind of a cultural practice that's no longer specific to the art field but relates to a lot of other fields that have their own moment of becoming cultural you know, self-consciousness, self-conscious cultural producers, and also thinking about working on this level of, of an aesthetic, of, a, of an expression that is not just, you know, handing out leaflets that are, you know, 10-point uh, font printed, you know, from front to, to, to bottom, which, you know, we all know these, these type of leaflets. And um, so I, th I think there's actually happening a, a lot, but the, the structure and the institutions of the um, of the of, of the art field are not particularly helpful. I mean, mostly. I mean, sometimes they are, and they are very interesting uh, um, experiments uh, uh, happening now at Documenta and, and you know similar places. Uh, but it's still more the exception than the rule. Okay. Thanks very much. Uh, that was amazing. It's kind of really. Good explanation of you know where we are now and how we got here. Uh, I guess I want to just notice some little moments. You're kind of really pushing us into something new, but there seem to be one or two moments where you're kind of reluctant to give up on certain things. So what you've just said, it felt like cause and effect might be coming back in there a little bit. You started with existentialism, which is like this quintessential modernist. And the subject is, is still kind of in there. And I, so I'm kind of wondering, you know, what is it that you're not, you know, <coughs> letting go for? And, and, and the emphasis on language. I mean, that's very Gutenbergian. And it feels like you're, what you're saying and what your work's telling us and what the lot of things, not just your writing, but some of your activities, you're pushing us into this new whatever we're going to call it. And that seems to be moving out of the Gutenberg, but there's some, some little bits that you're kind of hanging on there and going, well, I don't want to completely give up on the human subject. There's still a bit of existentialism a little there. There's still a bit of cause and effect. There's still, I'm going to explain this in terms of language rather than something else. I'm kind of, I want to cheekily prod yeah, you yeah. some of that. Um, and, and one mm. reason, because my question was related to what you just said, Gary. Uh, what language, what do you mean by language? Because it's a... Uh, um, that's a very open thing, mm -hmm. I think, in this context. Is mm -hmm. what would it mean to devise a language or to find a language uh, for for today? Mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah, I mean, you're, you're, you're perfectly right. And um, that there's, there's obviously a lot of discussion going on about you know, the consequences of this decentering, where you no longer you know, have uh, the human uh, being as kind of the, the apex of evolution and, 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 and you, you know, all of that. And um, there's a lot of um, kind of post-human post humanist thinking that really tries, uh, uh, really, um, you know, goes a long way into saying this, this, you know, kind of every form of existence is, 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 is in a way... Um, equivalent to another one, which I have certain doubts about, and simply because, on, and that's why I think this, 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 this notion of hyper-object is important to me, uh, we really live in a world of human making and unmaking. And with that, we have a, a, a much larger responsibility for that than I would you know, I, I would have a hard time, you know, blaming mushrooms and and lichens and, and all the rest of it for the condition we are in, right? So recognizing that we existentially relying on their co-production of the world is not to say, it's not the same than saying, um, you know, our capacities, um, particularly our destructive capacities, give us a, a, a particular position within these networks. So that's why I'm not going all the way kind of to, to the post-humanist, post which makes it difficult for me then to devise of a politics. So I, I, I would be, you know, yes, artificial intelligence is agency, but, you know, it still has a lot of our, our marks in it and we're responsible you know, for this thing that will never be fully autonomous, that again is for me a way of abdicating uh, responsibility. Oh, the computer says no, right? What can I do? And um, the other question um, of, um, so, so the, the subject and subjectivity for me remains important. It's a question, can we think of this different in a different way um, than, uh, you know, the, the, the classic modern subject. And yes, sure, the, the existentialism is a bit of a, a contradiction there, but, but the, this notion of, of it, I only take it as the notion of being in the, you know, being thrown in the world, the world is already there before you show up and then you're, you're here, right? And um, the language, I was hoping not to have spoken too much of language, but rather of aesthetics. As, and aesthetics for me is more than, than, than you know, verbal language. You know, it's, it's kind of a multi-sensory sensory way of understanding the world and these senses n do not necessarily need to be all human. But then again, within a kind of a human, a, a, a human uh, uh, you know, sociality, language in this in the sense of, a, of of verbal or written language remains a really important part and it's it is particularly the part that is most amendable to my own kind of practice are there more questions oh, yes <laughs> Michael Pabish uh, and then oh. Richard Pustins. all right sorry could you uh, elaborate a little bit on the notion of the commons from here. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> of course, there is quite a lot of discussion going on about the commons, Silvia Federici, for example, and the notion of re-enchanting the world. And that relates to what you said, if I understood you well, that there is a hope in pre-modern kind of way of thinking. So the commons, Silvia Federici, could you just mm. a little bit more elaborate on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the one of the most, and it's where I'm coming from, one of the most surprising aspects of digital culture is the emergence of, of uh, you know, non-proprietary resources that are not at the fringes of, of kind of the logic of, of the system, 
but really at the heart in, in terms of software, in terms of science, um, with, which for me in a way indicates that uh, there are certain aspects and, and, and I mean there have always been certain aspects that, that capitalism couldn't produce but had to rely on other um, um, you know, ways of, of, of being together. Um, Federici you know, talks a lot about um, the need of capitalism to, to rely on reproductive work that is, that is done for free. And in, in a way you can understand, at least in the in, in, in kind of digital context, the comments in a, in a similar way. It's, 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 it's something that, that um, produces something that capitalism needs, but in a way that capitalism itself cannot produce it in terms of you know, certain type of knowledge goods. But I think beyond that, which I, I think is, is what we have at the moment, but beyond that, I also think it's really um, a, a, a cultural practice of trying to negotiate and understand the world through sharing information, sharing objects, passing around you know, images and films and, and stuff like that, um, that creates something like a shared a shared horizon of things that are important to us. So I, I, I see this in a particular way I talked here is more as a, as a, as a shared cultural practice in, in which we come to agree on uh, which things in the world are important and which are the references that we need to pay attention to and what kind of you know, what kind of good or bad life comes of, out of this way of seeing the world. And we have to do that collectively. We have to do that together. Otherwise, it's impossible to act together. If we don't understand, if we don't agree upon what world exists, what is important in the world, and then we will never be able to, to purposefully act in the world on the scale that we need to. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, I'm curious uh, how you treat these three categories, escapism, control, uh, and coexistence, because they are not three different types of immersivity. It is actually aspect uh, and just three of much mm. bigger mm. number mm. of aspect uh, defining uh, uh, immersivity mm. or immersive world. Mm. Uh, it's very easy to find examples who are in the same time uh, escapist, uh, under control and uh, based on mm. coexistence. So I'd like you yeah. to comment on yeah. this. And uh, the second point, uh, you told something like that uh, uh, subjectivity is not at the moment uh, opposition to objectivity, that instead of uh, subjectivity you propose situatedness. Uh, I'm not quite sure about this. I would rather say that we still have to do with opposition between objectivity and subjectivity, mm. but they are both situated. And this changed everything. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I separated control, uh, um, uh, escape, and, and, and coexistence into three categories to, be, uh, to make it easier to talk about. And also because they, they so it's kind of analytical abstractions, uh, but they point to different politics. They point to different, uh, you know, worlds that are, and reasons and, 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 and kind of motivations of constructing these immersive worlds that I think we need in order to understand where we are, but they're, you know, depending on who, con who constructs it and with which purpose, they, are, they serve different, you know, different goals. If we, we say, yes, it's important, I mean, this, there is in, in Silicon Valley the idea of you know, a basic social income that we can give to everyone 
that we don't need anymore because we have we have automated everything and then they can play computer games all all all, all day and they're you know nice and quiet and you know they they're just you know uh, above subsistence level but you know are taken care of which is you know this, this kind of this this notion that, that we you know built these 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 fantasy worlds so that people don't deal with you know the situation they're they're living in and in a way this is you know, as I said, this is kind of the original metaverse, metaverse notion, and and in many ways it's also the, the the kind of the current metaverse notion, and this is this, this idea that um, I mean, there's it another for me quite absurd, but you know, taking taking seriously discussion about whether we don't live in a simulation, whether I mean, it's not already you know one of a million possible worlds and it's which is you know operating in some computer of, uh, somewhere and if you have this notion then obviously the simulated and the real becomes totally exchangeable and then you know, you have something like like, like you know, if, if you listen to Zuckerberg saying you know finally you can meet people like in real in real life right and it the immersion is so so complete and so rich that you won't see a difference Right, and this this for me is also uh, a, you know really problematic, um, and it's, it's the same is with the notion of of uh, you know space explorations and colonizing Mars. This is really a fantasy that gives up on on f on on kind of the biological physical world. Plus, in if 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 you know if if we think of um, this as um, as uh, uh, an extension of what what Facebook is already doing. You can see what it means if one entity controls your ex entire experience. Right? It makes it it makes that entity very very rich, and everyone else worse off. So I think this is really a a, a very profound danger that that is more than theoretical. I think the question whether we're living in a in a in a uh, simulation and everyone will get uh, universal basic income to play uh, to play computer games all day this is quite a theoretical we'll never get there but the other one I think is uh, and, and this notion of, of, of an ever tighter control um, you can see this already you know, you know, it's, 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 it's obviously not just Facebook but um, uh, you, you see this in other places is, is, is quite real and the the third one is 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 obviously more of a of a of an aspiration because I think we are you know this this immersion and this coexistence is real. We see this, but if if we don't, I mean, we we feel this, right? The the uh, oceans are rising. You know, when we walk here down the street, we we you know we barely make it uh, 300 meters because it's so hot. This is not you know. We, we cannot ignore it other than trying to to escape in, 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 in some fantasy world. So we have to do that. And I think it will be done. The question is how? And how much of a say do we have in that? That was the second part of the question. I, already, I forgot. You have to Objectivity and subjectivity. Aha, uh -huh, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, the, the old modern idea was that if you're not objective, you're subjective, and then you're not scientific, then, you know, anything goes, and yeah, you see it like this, and I see it like that, so, you know, fine, we'll never get an agreement, but, you know, we're all living in our own in encapsulated worlds. And I, and I think that, and, and, and the alternative is to, to be in this, in this world of, of God's view, or the view from nowhere, how, you know, how this was called. And I think that the recognition that you can, that you can be factual and scientific, but it still means that you speak from a particular point of view and from a particular experience, from a particular body, from a particular set of, you know, technological capacities and, and, and you know, personal and collective histories. And that makes this view, even though it's factual, it's, it makes it partial. And other situated views can see different things, also factual. So this is not science, non-science, which the object, objective, subjective was. 
And then obviously also subjectivity, which is not the same in, for me now than saying this is a subjective view. Also subjectivity, the way we experience ourselves and our relations to the world, is something that is situated, absolutely. Thank you. I think we will need to, um, to wrap up right now. But I think there are many, many topics that we can go back to on Sunday during the roundtable discussion. Um, thank you very much, Felix. Thank you. Okay, and now there's a 10 minute break. Thank you very much.